Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Thanks for watching Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage Vault Series. The Vault Series is a series of interviews that we shot starting back in 2004, two years before the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum opened to the public. If you like what you see, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Thanks for watching. Today's clip is with Bill Carson, longtime Fender employee. Bill gives his impression of what Leo Fender was really like as a, as a man and as a businessman and the impact that the Fender Stratocaster had in all continents that produced Strat copies even without permission from Fender. Uh, he felt like it was a, the right thing to do to, to let them make those instruments and it, you know, it fed and clothed a lot of kids in a lot of places. Hope you enjoy it. I watched a, a, a History Channel show yesterday uh, showing the birth of motorcycles, how they, how they got started, where they went, and in the in final analysis, the guy said that Harley Davidson and the Fender Stratocaster are the two most knocked off items in the world. So it, it gets play all over. There's a music expo in Seattle has got, got a shot of this, the same thing on the birth of the Stratocaster. And I used to complain to Leo <coughs> about the Japanese and others that were just taking us to the cleaners on cheap knockoffs and what was our original ideas. And, and he said, if you think about it and think of all the kids that are going to school being fed and clothed and mortgage payments made, house payments made and car payments made, of all the people all over the world that are enjoying the benefits of that strategy, he said, you'll change your mind. I never thought about it in, in that conception, but that was the kind of man that Leo Fender was. I, uh, he, he had some sides that very few people knew about him. He was, he was very frugal, but he, he was also extremely generous to the boys' home and <clears throat> orphans' home in Fullerton. And uh, I, I was present one time when he, he ate a stockbroker out over the telephone. He never raised his voice. Anytime you hear any stories about Leo shouting or screaming, it never happened because he was a very soft-spoken man, but he could strip you <laughs> with soft-spoken words if, you, if he decided that you were in the wrong. But I heard him chew out a stockbroker over the telephone because he'd lost him a few hundred dollars on a particular stock. And within 10 minutes, his attorney called wanting to get a check okayed for $100,000 for the boys' home, that they were planning some kind of an addition out there to expand it. And he okayed that $100,000 over the telephone right after being upset by the few hundred dollars with the stockbroker. That was the kind of person he was. I don't know of most L.A. area Orange County guitar players that didn't that didn't uh, owe him a vote of thanks one way or the other. He he had to ex ex depend exactly on on what input that he could get from players uh, in order to further his ability to stretch his product line because he didn't know these nuances of all that himself. And as a result of it, he would have various players in. Uh, to just get their ideas, but so many of them would tell him, he'd ask questions and so many of them would tell him answers that they thought he wanted to hear. They, they wouldn't tell him, no, Leo, the baby is born ugly. You've got to change it. Here's what's wrong. You've got to do it. I did that all the time, and I, I think that's why we had such a good friendship is the only thing I wanted from him was what he could do for me through my feedback to him. And... Uh, we had many, many years of, of a good relationship as a result of that. But he, as soon as he discovered that somebody was telling him things that just for the sake of maybe that he could get a free amp or a free guitar or whatever, he, he, he would do away with them from there on. He wouldn't have anything to do with them. He worked seven days a week and almost around the clock. You go by that plant, drive by the plant on Sunday, any time in the early afternoon or morning, for that matter, you'd see his old Chrysler's parked down there by the lab. And that was his life. He, 
He lived and did that every day, far beyond from the time that he was, he was capable of, of making too many decisions. He still felt the need to work. He would endlessly take a breadboard model of a guitar, which would be just a, a lap board model like this, and it might have a first and a sixth string on it, and he'd have movable pickups to where he could pick a string and move it, listen to it. He had Freddie build him. He was so pitch deaf, he thought if he could hear better, he could hear pitches better. Freddie built him a big baffle with 36 10-inch speakers on it, and, and casters, of course, to move it around. It was a big thing, and he would pick that string, watch, watch an, an electronic instrument, and slide that, that pickup back and forth. He did that endlessly to the last part of his life I'm talking about, because finally, shortly before he died, he came home and told Priscilla, his second wife, uh, I've done all for the musician that I can. And she said, he, he just from that day forward, he just kind of folded. And uh, when he died, I think that the whole musical world had the recognition of one of the greatest men ever to make contribution to the music industry. There was a, a period of time that I understand that they were actually thinking about discontinuing the Stratocaster. That's and true, that's true. The, the Stratocaster and the Telecaster. At that time, I was, I was in charge of, of uh, production for a short period of time because <coughs> we were looking for a, an operations manager, a manufacturing manager, and uh, I got put into the position. I, I, my off, I had two offices then, one in Fullerton and one in, in uh, Santa Ana where sales were. And uh, the build-out program, uh, Telecaster sales were, were, were falling fairly rapidly. Stratocaster sales was kind of on the coattails of it. And uh, so we had enough material. We got together the inventories of material to build out, and we started a build-out program to, to, to drop both of these from the line, <clears throat> and very little behind it to replace them. And uh, during that interim, there, there was a, and I forget which real high-profile player it was, that, that it was over Stratocaster, and the sales, the sales just started going out the roof over the Strat because of him and one more guy, another guy that followed him. And uh, I want to say Clapton, but I'm unsure about the timing on this. Hen Hendri Hendrix, I believe, was the guy too. That was the 60s, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, he was it. And uh, the, the funny part of it was that not only did the Strat sales increase dramatically, but the Telecaster sale just hung on to the skirts of it and went right up too. And from that point on, it's been increasing ever since. <clears throat> this, this particular year is the greatest year that Fender has ever had. Uh, <clears throat> their last time, uh, which was a couple of months ago, I guess, that uh, Bill Schultz called me on another matter. We were talking, he, he was disgruntled because he was sitting on $50 million worth of back orders and couldn't fill them, and most of it American-made product. And we, we have, of course, uh, uh, licensed uh, manufacturing all, all over the world in uh, Taiwan, China, Korea, Japan, and uh, a lot of the product that comes in are made to Fender Specs. Our engineers go over, set it up the way it's supposed to be made, and then uh, from there on, it's up to them to furnish the product. And some of those companies, we own a part of it in order to guarantee us to get our share of their merchandise. And uh, it's for the music industry, I, I would think that 04 and 05 is probably going to be the best years of anybody, in anybody's lifetime for sales, overall sales and interest. I think the computer games have, although they, they have a lot of, of the same type customer in that age bracket uh, profile, uh, the interest in music has, has been seeded 
by several different people for a long period of time now throughout the schools. Bill Schultz is a, is a very strong proponent of that. We've got a lot of programs that, uh, that cost the student and the school practically nothing just to get them interested in playing a guitar or anything else, but to get music involved. And those programs became very weak for a long time. And now they're, they're, they're picking up strength. And as a result, <clears throat> That that interest is is beginning to show itself through through sales throughout the uh, retail outlets, and uh, you don't the, the youngster doesn't have just one guitar anymore. If something strikes his fancy, usually him or his parents or or can afford the second and third, sometime on and on, for the models that he wants, depending on how much money they've got to spend. <clears throat> 